So, hi, I'm Rachel Gross. I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, I work very closely with Dr. Grossman, and um, I see patients in the um, Penn Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center, which is over at Pennsylvania Hospital. So I'm going to talk today actually about um, corticobasal degeneration and about a related condition called progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, and uh, this is an outline of the talk, and it will start with a brief, let me, a brief introduction. Um, first, we'll talk about CBD, um, then about PSP, and then I'll show you just very briefly some of our research into some everyday problems faced by people that have CBD and PSP and their caregivers. Um, we'll talk also about this similar kind of problem of the clinical pathological mismatch that Dr. Grossman was talking about, and then I'll go through some treatment options. So let's just first talk about how CBD and PSP are related to FTD. And so Dr. Grossman just went through how the um, FTD can be related to the accumulation of tau in the brain or the accumulation of TDP43 in the brain. And um, CBD and PSP are um, also related to the abnormal accumulation of the protein tau in the brain. So these are, like FTD, these are um, progressive neurological conditions. And also like FTD, they have, um, they're marked by changes in cognition and behavior. And many of them are actually you know, overlap with the kinds of things that Dr. Grossman was talking about. But in addition, these are movement disorders. So people have difficulty of motor function. And sometimes you might hear somebody refer to these as atypical Parkinsonism or even Parkinson's plus syndromes. And they get these names because um, they have certain features, especially movement features in common with kind of typical Parkinson's disease. But as you'll see, they have their own unique features as well. So um, causes of CBD and PSP. Um, are probably related to some combination of uh, genetics and environmental factors. Um, inherited forms are rare. Um, they're thought to be rare. However, um, recent research, even in our um, center, has identified variations in genes that may make one relatively susceptible to these conditions. And as we mentioned, um, there's underlying pathology that's been identified, which again is this accumulation of um, abnormal tau in the brain, and in particularly in the parts of the brain that control movement, cognition, and behavior. So let's move on now to talk about um, CBD, or corticobasal degeneration. So this is a rare, a pretty rare condition, and it also affects relatively you know, young people with um, a peak in the seventh decade, and men are thought to be about equally um, frequently affected as women. So this issue of how CBD starts or, or how it presents itself has historically been an area of some controversy. So when CBD was first identified, um, it was thought to have no cognitive or behavioral problems at all. It was thought to be only a movement disorder. And over time, it's been increasingly recognized that, in fact, cognitive problems can be an early or very prominent part of this condition. And so when you kind of look across studies, it's about a quarter to a half of patients that start out with a, a movement problem. Um, about 50% of patients at the very beginning will have some difficulty with um, cognition. And there are some people with CBD who start out looking a lot like FTD, like behavioral variant FTD, although that's a bit less common. So let's first talk about the, the motor problems. This is a, typically a very asymmetric condition where one limb is affected way out of proportion to the other limb. It starts out that way, and it generally stays that way through the course of the illness. What you'll hear about is difficulty using the limb that gets progressively worse, such that the person might say that their limb is useless to them. And sometimes people may say that um, they don't even feel like the limb is part of their own body. The um, limb can become very stiff or even contracted so that it's hard to relax. Um, and then, as Dr. Grossman mentioned, there are involuntary movements of different kinds. Um, there are things like dystonia, where the limb might take on a certain posture, like a fist. Um, there's myoclonus, where there might be quick jerks of the limb. And then there's something called an alien limb phenomenon, 
which is kind of like the name implies. The, the limb sort of has a mind of its own, and it, um, it might, let's say, for example, levitate up off the chair without the uh, patient being aware of that. Um, and some people will have a tremor. There can be walking difficulty, and then this difficulty articulating speech sounds, which Dr. Grossman had referred to as speech apraxia. So this here um, is a set of common cognitive and behavioral problems that can occur in CBD. And there's a couple that I'd like to highlight in particular. So the first one is this difficulty that you can also see in FTD with planning and organizing multitasking, problem solving that causes a lot of difficulty for individuals. And then I also want to highlight this problem seeing. So a lot of the times people that have CBD will seem as if they can't see, like the way they interact with their environment, it seems like they can't see. And they actually don't have a problem with vision per se. Um, it's actually um, a difficulty processing visual information at a higher level. So for example, People with CBD have a lot of difficulty appreciating the relationship between things in space. And so they might have trouble finding a chair or getting through a doorway, um, finding the arm of their sleeve you know, to get dressed, um, or even reaching accurately for an object. Um, another kind of difficulty that they have is um, the sort of seeing the forest for the trees problem. So they might look at a visual scene and kind of focus in on the details, but not kind of understand how it is integrated into a whole. In general, memory is relatively spared. Um, and it's very, I mean, it's, it's really not seen that people with CBD would have hallucinations. So I wanted to show you an example from a patient in my clinic that might help you see what I'm talking about with this visuospatial problem. And there's a complicated figure there, and then there's an example of the individual copying it. And you can see that there's difficulty just kind of understanding how the elements of the figure um, are related to each other in space and how to kind of combine them into an integrated whole. So Dr. Grossman showed you this pathology. This is the same kind of pathology that's seen in the um, non-fluent variant of progressive aphasia. And on the left is a pale area, these may in fact be the same pictures, a uh, pale area with um, loss of brain cells and the balloon neurons. And um, on the right is um, a, a dark area that is stain positive for tau. So I wanted to show you a typical MRI in a patient that has CBD. But for comparison, um, on the right here, you see a, a normal brain MRI. And, and this is a a slice through the brain kind of horizontally um, where the uh, front of the head is at the top and the back of your head is at the bottom here. And the dark area is brain and the bright area is fluid that everybody has around the brain. And I think what you can appreciate is that there's loss of brain tissue in the frontal area of the brain and in this part back here circled in blue which is called the parietal area. And there's two things that so you can also appreciate that this is pretty asymmetric. And I think that kind of follows with the fact that the condition itself is very asymmetric in how the person will present. Um, and this frontal part of the brain is involved with the kinds of thinking and memory and, or, uh, sorry, thinking, planning and organizing and problem solving type um, issues that we discussed. And this part back here, the parietal lobe, that's um, involved in that kind of visual spatial processing that we talked about. So you can see, looking at the scan, why the individuals might have the kinds of problems that we discussed. OK, so we're going to move on to progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a, um, a related condition. And I'm going to show you kind of what the typical um, individual with PSP would be experiencing. But in my um, clinic, I feel like a lot of people actually have um, signs or symptoms of both P PSP and CBD. OK, also a similarly rare condition um, presenting in the seventh decade. And, and it seems as if it may be a little bit more frequent in men. So CBD, I'm sorry, PSP is more symmetric than CBD. Um, and often the trunk is more stiff than the limbs. And so when you think of somebody, maybe you've seen somebody with regular Parkinson's disease, they're often stooped over. 
Um, somebody with PSP is typically has an arched back and an upright posture, and their head may be even pulled back a little bit. Um, there is early loss of what I'm going to call the writing reflex. The writing reflex is what keeps you standing upright. And so because of this, there's a lot of trouble with balance and very frequent falls. And this typically occurs pretty early in the disease course. Um, in addition, the part of the brain that allows us to voluntarily move our eyes up and down um, is affected in PSP, and so there's difficulty of that kind, which in everyday life can kind of come out as double vision, difficulty reading, difficulty on the stairs, because you may need to look down, you know, when you're walking up and down the stairs. Um, people can have freezing, which is that they're trying to walk, and they get kind of frozen, um, and it takes a few, you know, kind of seconds before they can get going again. There can be a tremor. Um, there can be a difficult problem of involuntary eyelid closure. Um, and then people with PSP often have difficulty with their speech so that they're hard to understand and difficulty swallowing. Let's, so the cognitive problems are, um, that are seen commonly in PSP are listed here. And again, I want to highlight a few of them. Um, there is this same difficulty with planning and organizing and multitasking that we've been talking about. And, and then there's this sort of, and, and you can see this in FTD as well, this kind of getting hung up, you know, where um, the person might be paying attention to, you know, something very small, like a, um, a piece of, like a tiny piece of paper on the desk that, you know, somebody else might ignore altogether. And they may get stuck on that. They can get stuck on other things. They might repeat what you say. They might repeat what they say. Um, and, and this kind of um, inability to sort of move on uh, to a new behavior is called perseveration. Some of the biggest difficulties that I think I hear from caregivers has to do with the concepts of apathy and impulsivity, um, which we're going to talk about in a little bit more uh, detail in a moment. So this here is a, another little sort of test that you might have seen um, Dr. Grossman give in the clinic. And this is basically called trail making. And what it's looking at is mental flexibility. So what you're asking somebody to do is alternate between numbers and letters, 1A, 2B, 3C. And what happens in a person who has PSP started out well. It went from 1 to A to 2. And then this kind of getting hung up, hung up problem happened where they got drawn not to the correct circle, but to the one right there next to it, and then didn't have the mental flexibility to kind of start switching again and just did six, seven, eight. And so that's the kind of problem you might find um, in somebody that has PSP. So let's talk a little bit about this issue of apathy. And I pay a little bit of attention to this because it is a pretty common problem in PSP. I think certain series in the literature have you know, estimated about 90% of patients with PSP have this issue. And it's been shown um, many times over to be one of the most um, frustrating and distressing um, things for a caregiver. Um, and I have to say that it's one of the main things that'll come up in you know, my clinic visits with um, individuals and their families. So this is just, um, you. some of you in the room here may have actually filled out some of these surveys. This is basically a survey that asks different questions that might get at this issue of apathy. And you're basically on the bottom here, you see, you know, does your loved one have initiative? Does your loved one get things done? Does your loved one have a lack of concern about his or her condition? Does your loved one get excited when, um, you know, something happy or something good happens? And then you're asked to kind of rate it as whether it's not at all characteristic, slightly characteristic, somewhat characteristic, or very characteristic. And there's a whole bunch of these items on the, on the survey. And I guess what I wanted to sort of show you is that, you know, patients that have the individuals that have PSP 
um, do have you know, a lack of initiative, they do have difficulty getting things done, and they do have trouble you know, getting excited when something good is happening. And there's also a, it's somewhat characteristic for them to have you know, less concern about their condition than you know, maybe you have or that you think would be appropriate. And so I think it's easy to see how some of these things would cause a lot of distress um, between an individual and their care partner on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a slide of um, the pathology in PSP, and really the, the point here is that it stains positive for tau as well. This is also a tau condition. And rather than it being in those kind of, um, this sort of just a different shape to the way the, the, the tau accumulates. That's basically all that's showing. So let me show you an MRI of an a individual with PSP. And um, over here again is a normal uh, brain. And this is now a different way of looking at the brain. This is sort of down the center like this. And so this up here is the face and the front of the head. And this is the back of the head. And this is the brain here going down into the spinal cord. And the first thing I hope you can appreciate is that there's sort of a loss of tissue here in the frontal lobe. And that's the kind of thing that would cause this difficulty with planning and organizing and also cause this um, sort of apathy that we were talking about. And in addition, this area of the brain here in the brainstem is called the midbrain. And this part of the brain is responsible for certain aspects of movement and balance, but also for that ability to move the eyes up and down. And I don't know if you can appreciate it so well, but it's sort of full looking in here, and it's, it's pretty thinned out right there. And, and that's um, the kind of thing you might see in somebody that has PSP. OK. So um, going to talk about some research of ours uh, looking at some um, kind of functional consequences in everyday life of having uh, CBD and PSP. So first, we looked at the ability to tell a story. And, and why did we pay attention to this? This is because you know, storytelling is a very prominent part of our daily conversations with each other. Um, this would be the means by which, you know, I would go home and I would, you know, tell my family about this conference today and, you know, the talk that I gave and, and meeting all of you. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of how this can become impaired in somebody that has CBD. So how would I tell this story? Hopefully you'll think it's coherent. So, um, <laughs> So it's nighttime, and um, there's a little boy, and he got ready for bed by taking off his shirt and his socks and his boots and his slippers, and he got into bed and went to sleep with his best friend, this dog. And um, while he was asleep, his pet frog escaped from the jar. So that's how I might describe what I'm seeing in, in the scene. Um, but here's what um, an individual with CBD said. It's a little boy in bed with his dog, and there's a frog in a jar, and there's slippers there, and there's a shirt and a sock and boots and a stool and a window and a bed and a lamp. And so I think what I hope you can appreciate from that is that the individual can, you know, focus, you know, can kind of see all of the things that are in the picture. Um, she has the name for all the things in the picture, but doesn't really capture kind of how they all fit together. And so I think as the listener, you might not take away a coherent account of what's happening in the scene. And this problem can cause a significant issue for communication uh, with somebody who has uh, CBD. And um, when we looked at the brain, we saw that this kind of problem with um, creating a coherent story was related, as shown here in this red color, to atrophy or, or loss of brain volume in the frontal part of the brain and in the parietal part of the brain. And those were the two parts that I had showed you were sort of thinned out on the MRI scan. So we know those are areas of the brain that are affected in CBD. So, um, another major concern to us is decision making in um, individuals with CBD and PSP um, because sometimes they, they may make decisions that put them at risk of hurting themselves. Um, and so we're in the process of trying to understand why this occurs. So what we did is we showed people these kind of common everyday scenarios and I wonder whether some of these things will sound familiar to any of you. So, you were about to sit down at a desk to start a crossword puzzle when you accidentally dropped your pen on the floor. 
And there are three solutions to this problem, three potential decisions to choose from, um, which vary in the amount of risk. So the safest one is just to, you know, if let's say you were, um, you had trouble with your balance, the safest one would be to leave the pen on the floor and look, just, you know, sit down and look for another one in the desk drawer. And then there's maybe an intermediate risk where you make sure you hold on to something nearby and then bend down and pick up the pen. And then the riskiest option would be that you would just suddenly and quickly bend over from where you're standing to pick up the pen. And we asked different questions. So first we asked the individual with CBD or PSP, um, you know, which do you think is the safest choice? And what I'm trying to show here with this riskiness scale is that they all knew what they were supposed to do. Every single one of them knew what the safest option was there. And then if you say, well, what do you typically decide to do in a situation like this? Well, then the risk goes up. And then when you ask the caregiver what the loved one does in a situation like this, the risk goes up even higher. Um, and so I guess this sort of mismatch between what the individual knows and what the individual does at home on a daily basis is something that we're trying to understand better. Okay, so let's move on to the problem of clinical pathological mismatch. So um, this pie chart here is meant to represent a set of people that have CBD from Penn. And the point that I want to get across is that it's only this part in blue where the person who looked like they had CBD in the office actually had CBD in the brain. All of these other cases here were a different condition that was mimicking CBD clinically. Um, for example, Alzheimer's disease in the brain can present like CBD, or Parkinson's disease like pathology in the brain can present like CBD. So I just want to show you an example of a study which demonstrates this is a lot like what Dr. Grossman was showing you in FTD. I just wanted to show you an example of a study which demonstrates how we might try to predict which CBD patients have CBD in the brain and which are more likely, in this case, to have Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain. So we had 35 patients with CBD, and we used these um, spinal fluid markers that Dr. Grossman described that can help differentiate um, between somebody who's likely to have Alzheimer's disease and somebody who's not. And so there were 24 of these people who were likely to have underlying CBD in the brain and 11 of people who we thought were likely to have underlying Alzheimer's disease in the brain, even though all of them in the office, you know, looked like they had CBD and that was their clinical diagnosis. So when we compared the two groups, um, those um, individuals who looked like CBD in clinic but were more likely to actually have Alzheimer's disease in the brain had difficulty with specific language issues and had atrophy in a part of the brain involved in language production and comprehension. And so the bottom line of this um, kind of a study is that there were certain clinical features and certain MRI patterns that helped us distinguish between CBD patients likely to have CBD and CBD patients likely to not have CBD, and in this case, Alzheimer's disease going on in the brain. So knowing whether somebody's CBD is truly due to CBD uh, in the brain or another disease process that can mimic CBD will matter a lot when we have new treatments that are targeted at the protein tau, um, as Dr. Grossman talked about. Um, and then we'll know whom to treat, and we'll be able to initiate treatment as early as possible. So the final slide has to do with treatment options. Oops. Um, so at the moment, there are not treatments available to cure or to slow down the progression of CBD or PSP. Um, so most of our focus is on management of bothersome symptoms. And there are a lot of pretty effective things that we can do we depend very heavily on our colleagues in physical, occupational, and speech therapy. And at Pennsylvania Hospital, there is a, a rehab center um, that is specifically um, dedicated to individuals with movement disorders. And they are a fantastic resource. And they have a lot of great ideas about 
assist devices, everyday modifications, um, things to help with projecting one's voice um, that they can offer. In addition, there are medications for a lot of different symptoms, including the stiffness, some of the involuntary movements, um, trouble with sleep, um, trouble with depression, and we actually use Botox a lot. So Botox, it turns out, is not just for wrinkles. Um, Botox can be used to um, not just relax the lines in your forehead, but actually can be used to relax a stiff limb or to relax your eyelids just enough that they don't close involuntarily. And they actually can be helpful for people that are having difficulty swallowing and have some, some drooling as a result because it can actually uh, dry out the, the mouth and reduce the amount of um, saliva being produced by the salivary glands. Um, so that's another option that can be used for some folks that have uh, CBD and PSP. Um, and then I won't go into this again because you just heard about it from Dr. Grossman, but you know, we're, you know, I'm also extremely excited about the, um, you know, new um, compounds that are targeted at Tau. And as he mentioned, we did just complete a, a divunatide trial at Penn and there will be other trials coming. Um, and so I think this is, you know, a pretty exciting time uh, in the history of CBD and PSP. Um, so I guess we're gonna hold questions for the... Yeah. Okay.